mierda! ¡Bonita! Okay, we'll start with this. News recently broke that Saudi Arabia's Turkey Al Al Sheikh is looking to buy Matchroom, Top Rank, PBC, Golden Boy, and Queensbury Promotions companies to create a boxing league under one umbrella like the UFC model. This could be worth five billion to establish, but it would change the landscape of boxing. To that, veteran boxing scribe Sasha Jones Sasha. expressed growing concerns, reacting to the news by saying, no doubt, this will have a negative effect on women's boxing. Could it? It's possible, it is entirely possible, that the women fighters, the women boxers, may not be a part of Turkey Al Al Sheikhs and the Saudis' overall vision of the future for the sport moving forward. They didn't have no female fighters on the Fury vs. Nganu card, the AJ vs. Nganu card, the Fury vs. Usyk show, the Matchroom 5 vs. 5. No women on those shows. Sasha may be onto something, but I don't think that in and it of itself heralds the demise of women in sport, women in boxing, and all the progress they've made. Here's why. Well, first you must consider the other markets that are out there. When you talk about boxing, you're usually talking about either the US market or the UK market. But there are several other markets out there that don't rely on Turkey Al Al Sheikh's investment and cash injections into the sport, like the Argentinian market and the Mexican market that hosts several female fighters, young and old, and they have for years. They still do. Fighters that they are still developing, new and young fighters that are coming through, female fighters. You also must consider the Australian market that also hosts several female fighters, young and old. Tasman fighters, no limit promotions, the shows that they do in Australia, they've got female fighters is on their undercards all the time. In the Japanese boxing scene, they do their own cards over there. Female fighters are on those cards. Consider that. As it pertains to the United Kingdom and the United States and those markets. While Turkey Al Al Sheikh and the Saudis might be interested in hosting the biggest of the big fights that involve fighters from that region or fighters based from those regions. Remember what I said. They're interested in hosting the biggest of the big fights. Your Fury versus Usyk, your Joshua versus Dubois, your Bivol versus Better Beef. But these are fights that have more or less already been built involving fighters that have more or less already been built. And where were they built? In the domestic boxing scene. Over time, it took years, it didn't happen overnight. And it's in the domestic boxing scene, on the smaller shows, the smaller fights, not necessarily the biggest of the big ones. The regular ones and the small hall shows. That's where the area of opportunity lies, has lied, and still lies for women boxers. In the UK and in the US. Other parts of Europe, don't forget Poland, they've got their own fight scene, their own boxing scene, their own MMA scene that also hosts several female fighters. Essentially, what I'm getting at is the Saudis want to host the biggest of the big fights that have more or less already been built. But what that doesn't speak to is the domestic boxing scene. And it's in the domestic boxing scene, the smaller shows and the regular size shows, not the huge ones that require huge money that only the Saudis can put up. Focus on the domestic boxing scene. I saw a tweet yesterday about how DAZN is a platform went into business with G BM Promotions, a lesser known, smaller promotional outfit based out of the UK that hosts several fights, and several of them are women's bouts, women's fights. This is what I mean. Like what you're seeing in Jaron Ennis's homecoming fight in the city of Philadelphia. Sky Nicholson's fighting on that undercard. That is a domestic fight, but there is a female fighter on the show. Like what you're seeing this weekend with Subriel Matias's homecoming fight. There is a female fighter 
on that show. The Vazerman show going down tomorrow. Barras versus McGowan. There's a female fighter on that undercard. There's a female fight. On that show, what are you saying? That just because the Saudis are interested in hosting the biggest of the big fights, that doesn't give them full agamonical control over every domestic boxing scene. And it has been in the domestic boxing scene where the opportunities have been for these female fighters. That's where the opportunities still are. Why? That's where everybody develops. The male fighters, the female fighters, the super fights, that's where they grow. The grassroots demand for them. And even if that's not what the Saudis are investing in and those aren't the kind of fights they're trying to host their involvement in the sport does not eliminate that launch pad that platform nope no matter how many of these big shows and big names they're willing to pay for those are just the ones that are already established before that where were their names established where did they develop in the domestic boxing scene on the smaller shows, the smaller fights, the same applies to the women fighters. It works that way for them too. I wouldn't worry too much about it. We don't know all the intricacies of this overall vision just yet. We're only getting bits and pieces about what the future might hold. But even if the Saudis are interested in hosting the biggest of the big fights, all of them moving forward. That doesn't eliminate women's bouts or opportunities for women in boxing. I wouldn't jump to that conclusion just yet because they're not all going to be big shows, huge shows that the Saudis pay for. Some of them are going to be domestic, more moderately sized shows in the domestic boxing scene. And that's where the opportunities are for women boxers. That's where they've always been. That didn't really change. Hey, wait. What? So, you guys, you guys sparred each other before. Yes. Yeah. What was that um, back then? How long ago was it? Uh, it was a long time ago, maybe seven years ago. And yeah, he was dominating his part, you know. Well, I have no excuses. Yeah, he was better. You said he dominated? His yeah, part? he dominated. Yeah. Why was he able to do you were more maybe in your prime? Listen, I, I don't like make any excuses. From my opinion, uh, I came out of uh, uh, from Ukraine, jet lag, you know, not ready. He was in the middle of camp. But all of this is just the worst excuses, you know. Now I believe I'm, I'm, I'm in the better shape. We had heard about this infamous sparring session weeks ago that a long time ago, approximately seven years according to Oleksandr Vazhdyk, David Benavidez managed to get the best of him in sparring. You know, that's probably why they picked him. Team Benavidez, that on the premise that a long time ago David had a good sparring session with Oleksandr Vazhdyk and now Vazhdyk is 37 years old many years later, that might be why they want to fight him. Sure. This admission from Oleksandr Vazhdyk might leave one thinking, well, beat you up in sparring. You're admitting he beat you up in sparring. How do we know he's not going to beat you up this weekend? Well, if sparring sessions were the final word on what happens under the hot lights in a professional fight, then Philippe Hergovic would have beat Daniel Dubois. Zerdo Ramirez would have beat Dimitri Bivol. But they didn't, did they? In spite of whatever happened behind closed doors in sparring under the hot lights, that's not how those fights played out. Oh yeah, in the sparring session, Hergovic did all right. In the actual fight, he lost. The same applies to Zerto. Seven years ago. The sparring session between David Benavidez and Alexander Vajdik took place seven years ago. That's what, 2017? So in 2017, David was a world champion. He had just beat Ronald Gavril for the vacant WBC title, where seven years ago, Vajdik was not a champion yet. No? No, he wasn't. He didn't become a world champion until the end. The very end of 2018 when he fought Adonis Stevenson. A bigger puncher. Bigger than anybody David's ever fought. What punchers? Has David Benavidez fought the likes of Adonis Superman Stevenson? I think that matters. What, the, you spot this guy seven years ago before he had fought the likes of a Stevenson, before he became a world champion and you did all right. I mean, that's good. I don't think it's bad. But I don't think it's everything either. I feel really good. First of all, I just want to give a big thanks to all the people that came out and support. You know, I love you guys, and uh, this Saturday is going to be for you guys. I worked extremely hard, and we're going for the knockout this Saturday. And if you do get the knock knockout, what is your plan moving forward in this weight class? Are you going to stay, or are you going to move back? My plan is just to conquer um, 170, uh, the light heavyweight weight class and the super middleweight weight class. Whoever comes, they could get it. We were interviewing a lot of fans. <laughs> We were interviewing a lot of fans before your arrival, and we got a lot of feedback. Obviously, you're aware they really want the Canelo fight. Have you spoken with Canelo? Do you think there's any movement on that, or do you not think it's going to happen? You know, I, I really believe in my heart that it's going to happen. When, I don't know, but we're 100% ready to get that, uh, get that fight and get that victory as well. And if that doesn't happen, is there any other opponent that you have your eye on currently? 
whoever. I'm ready to fight whoever and be whoever. I think that's why we, all the people love you. You really are ready to fight whoever. You're definitely a really aggressive fighter. Why do you think that is? You seem like such a, a nice guy, but when you get in there, it's a different type of fight. I just have a lot to prove to myself and uh, to the world. You know, I really do want to be the best of my generation. And until I make that happen, we're going to keep working hard. Still got Canelo on the brain ahead of his light heavyweight debut. I have my reservations about that, that he mentioned him by name, but he didn't mention the two champions at this weight by name. I don't like that. This is supposed to be a segue to them and the winner of their fight, but you're still thinking about Canelo. I don't like that. I wonder how David and his team view this fight. They view it as a fight against the guy who they beat up in sparring a couple of years ago who's older, longer in the tooth. I have my reservations about choosing opponents based on their weaknesses instead of their strengths. Are you looking past this guy? Is that why you still have Canelo on the brain? What is this fight to David Benavidez? Is it a segue to Undisputed at 175 or just something he's doing to keep busy? Keep busy with while he waits on the phone to ring Canelo. for the Canelo fight. Canelo. Oh yes, I'm a skeptic of David Benavidez. I have been because the entire time he was at super middleweight, he never fought any punchers there. And there have been some sizable punchers and big guys and he didn't fight any of them. Zero. I'm not quite a believer because he pounces on guys like David Lemieux or Caleb Plant after Canelo knocked him out. David didn't. David didn't knock him out. Even though he was exhausted running on fumes for the last four or five rounds of their fight, smaller than David Benavidez and older, not a harder puncher. David didn't knock him out. I know what you're going to tell me. You're going to tell me, well, Caleb was holding. He kept holding. Yeah, I know. Caleb was holding. And David, given his size and his youth and what is supposed to be his strength, he couldn't break the clinch. Against the smaller, older, gassed out fighter at 168. Now he's fighting this guy at 175. I mean, he's a still a big guy, so I expect in uh, his best shape. So I don't care if he's moving up or moving down. I'm in my best shape, and I expect in him to be in his best shape. Do you feel like now at your current age you are in your best shape? I think I am, yes. Amazing. You have a ton of experience. You're also a previous Olympian. How do you feel like that will fare against Benavidez? Uh, look, uh, he has more pro fights, and he is like a seasoned pro fighter. I think in terms of experience, we kind of even, he might even have the more experience because the quality of the fighters he had uh, can be even more than mine. But I have a longer career. I have 250 amateur fights, and I have something to show him. And so what do you think, what is your prediction of what's going to happen this weekend on Saturday? I think it's going to be exciting and great fight, and you will never regret it. You talk about experience. David Benavidez does have more pro fights and more rounds in the bank than Oleksandr Vojtik, but that's more pro fights and more rounds in the bank against who? Kyron Davis? Ronald Ellis? David Lemieux? How do they stack up against a guy like Adonis Superman Stevenson? I'd say that's the best scalp on Oleksandr Vojtik's resume. Adonis Stevenson. It's the best scalp on David Benavidez's resume. Serious question. Caleb Plant? Demetrius... Andre? Hmm. So it makes this a very intriguing fight. Very intriguing for me. The selling point, the whole reason I'm buying this weekend's pay-per-view, because I don't give a shit about the main event. Yeah. The overall undercard is more solid than your average Gervonta Davis undercard. This fight being the co-main event to the main event, it's very intriguing because I've often been skeptical of David Benavidez and I still am. What effect has staying at 168 as long as he has had on him? When you put your body through that, over and over again, it weakens you. Boiling down from upwards of 200 pounds all the way down to 168 as many times as David has done that to stay at 168. Over time, what effect has it had on him? His boxing? Not a very big believer in his boxing in terms of his nuts and bolts boxing, his boxing fundamentals. Am I supposed to be? David's fanboys often get upset at me when I say that he's largely benefited from a noticeable size advantage he's had over all these guys that he's fought. But where's the lie? And now that he's not fighting a little guy, now that he's not fighting someone that he clearly outsizes, I have my reservations. Guy with a bit of size, bit of pop, good pedigree, who can box and punch, box and move. I have my reservations. Am I not supposed to? Under the hot lights, in many ways, this is a new challenge for David, and he is in uncharted territory, even if it is against a familiar face, these are different circumstances. It's intriguing. You know, I don't want to underestimate David, but at the same time, it looks like he's underestimating Vajdik. It's intriguing. If 
Finally, in men's heavyweight news, on the heels of his first professional loss, Tyson Fury is back in the gym today, ahead of the Oleksandr Usyk rematch later on this year in late December. The king will reclaim his throne. Usyk, I'm coming for you. The path to redemption is all mine. I know what I have to do. I saw my shortcomings. Best believe, I am inevitable. Sounds good. So I often think of Tyson Fury as a guy who says a lot of things that sound good. They sound good. Frank is egging him on old fisheye saying, bring it on. Tyson Fury is going to reclaim his belt. Do you think he is? Not really, but what do you expect Frank Warren to say? If I'm skeptical of Tyson Fury, and if I have been, it's not simply because I dislike the guy. I can dislike the guy and still pick him to win a fight. I dislike Javante Davis, but I still picked him to beat Ryan Garcia and pretty much everybody he's fought so far. In spite of my dislike of that fighter and in spite of disliking Tyson Fury that's not why I thought Usyk would beat him that's why I enjoyed it and relish any and every opportunity to bring it up because I don't like him or his mouth breathing fans but that's not why I picked him to lose the fight that's not why I picked Usyk to beat him I picked Usyk to beat him based on nuts and bolts boxing and what the circumstances were what the circumstances are I don't know that Tyson Fury can solve this puzzle. Why? It's because his success so far has been largely predicated on the limitations of his opponents that he moves so much better than they do because they are slow and cumbersome and kluge. He has better range of motion. Coupled with his gargantuan size that he has the size that they do but the range of motion that they don't, it's an advantage over those big men but not an advantage over Alexander Yusik. You move better than they do, but you don't do anything better than this guy. And he doesn't take as good a punch. He doesn't take as good a shot as his fans would have you believe. He's been decked all throughout his career. He's been floored. He's been dropped. Been all through that. What's it been? Three? Close to four weeks since the fight? It's taken that long for Tyson Fury to resurface only after he was seen visibly inebriated in public. Escorted out of a bar after having one too many, face planting outside of that bar. He comes up with this video where he's hitting the heavy bag and I know that for his supporters, it won't take much but a few words from Tyson Fury to get them back on board and get them excited and start making bold proclamations. But when I think about the second fight, the rematch, what can he improve upon? Oh sure, he can start out by not sacrificing the first two rounds of it, acting like a fucking jackass and playing to the crowd. But the sooner you start, the sooner you get caught. You will get caught again. That once you buckle down and bite on your gum shield and you try to take it to this guy, that's how soon it'll take for you to get caught again, except the next time you get put down, you get put out. The next time. When Fury collapsed in that corner, Mark Nelson saved him. If the referee would have allowed Usyk to continue beating on Tyson Fury, he would have hit the floor and he wouldn't have got up. He saved him. There's enough left of Fury for there to be a second fight, but not enough left of him for him to win it. I don't see it.